Most recently, we were in Vancouver for about a year with a Chinese uh, church there, and we finished that assignment, and we've been traveling more in and out of Southeast Asia, spending some time in Vietnam, as well as uh, in India, uh, and uh, in, the bulk, in, in the area of Albania, into, into Greece, uh, working with pastors there in those regions. Those are our primary regions. Uh, something I did not uh, mention in the first service is we are, we just launched, it was active, but we relaunched a website called FLP, which stands for Faith Library Publications, FLP Chinese, spelled out, dot com. So uh, if you read Chinese, or if you know anyone that is Chinese and you want to witness to them, send them to that site. We have 10 books on, online now that have been translated uh, we have The New Birth uh, that's been translated, a book by Kenneth E. Hagan that's available. Uh, nine other titles, plus we have a, an MP3 uh, audio of healing scriptures, all in uh, Mandarin, Chinese Mandarin. So all of that material is free, absolutely free. They can go in. They don't have to do anything. They can download that to any device. Uh, we're constantly adding and updating that site. We're going to be adding... Uh, eventually up to about 25 different titles of faith-building publications, as well as uh, hopefully some MP4s that are voiceovers of uh, teaching that uh, is uh, in uh, subject-wise uh, by the Holy Spirit, by faith, by prayer, by healing. So all of that is available uh, to Chinese-speaking people globally. So if you know anyone, you can point them to that site. It's a great way to witness to people. They can download that information free. So we're glad that we can provide that free. We provide all of our resources free because we, uh, we believe God every day and He meets our needs. We don't have any sad stories to tell. God meets our needs and has been meeting our needs for the past 41 years that we've been serving Him full time. And so we praise God for people like you, this church and other churches and individuals who believe in what God is doing through uh, the ministry that God has called us to. And so we have wonderful partners, excellent partners. And so we appreciate that. Everything that we use is for the promotion of the gospel. That is our number one priority, is to bring the gospel to every nation around the world. Our focus has primarily been uh, Southeast Asia, Asia. My wife and I have lived over 17 years in Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, in Thailand, in Singapore, in China, in Hong Kong. And of course right now, if you've been following the news, there's a lot of situations uh, that are taking place, uh, especially in China and Hong Kong. And uh, we've been constantly in contact with people and praying uh, for individuals in that region of the world. Just to let you know that uh, the current director that's been uh, working in China, based out of Singapore, every week has been meeting online, uh, face to face, with about 50 individuals uh, from the north, northeast quadrant uh, or section of China. And they've been, he's been teaching every week particular Bible subjects. Uh, many of them are still, most of them are still locked down. And, uh, but God's word is penetrating, still penetrating. We cannot go to some of these regions due to uh, travel restrictions and travel bans. And of course, that, that's something that happened just recently Talk about something that's changed so rapidly. Uh, one day we're ready to travel, and two weeks later we're, we cannot travel due to restrictions. Uh, and that's been a difficult thing for me. My wife will tell you that because I'm one to go, and I would rather be overseas right now than here right now. That's where my heart is, and it's been difficult on me waiting. That's a hard thing. So when you're, you know, when you're living with a preacher who likes to go, she has to put up with me. And so she's been doing that. If, if we talk about the Bible, she's my only audience, so I preached to her for a while. So that's the only audience I've had for a while. But recently, we've been extending our reach through an online pat platform and uh, just finished a three-part series to pastors and churches in Albania. We had over 2,000 people online listening, and we're talking about what's going on in the world today and what God's Word has to say concerning the current situation. So today, I want to share a few thoughts with you about what's going on in the world as well as something that God has placed on my heart specifically for you this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for this church, 
the pastors, the staff, everyone that's working together. We thank you for this wonderful body of believers who is a light to this community and beyond. Around the world, Father, those who are tuning in on, online, live stream, Father, we thank you for them and we ask you today to speak to their hearts. Father, encourage them, inspire them, motivate them. And we thank you, Father, for doing that. We thank you, Father, for your anointing present in this service. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And we ask you today, Heavenly Father, to speak to our hearts, to encourage, inspire, instruct us from your word. And Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. Amen. I want to read a few scriptures to you from the book of Hebrews beginning in chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about the fact that you are a part of an unshakable kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God. It cannot be moved. It's not going anywhere. It is unshakable. It doesn't matter what Satan attempts to do to the church, what he's attempting to do through any type of a pandemic, or what he's attempting to do throughout the world. The church is here to stay. This kingdom God established 2,000 years ago is in this world for a purpose, it is to influence this world with God's power and God's life and God's love. It is to expand. And I love what Jesus said to Peter. He said, upon this rock, and that rock is the confession of the Lordship of Christ, the very gates of hell, the power of hell, cannot keep the church out. There are no geo geographical or geopolitical boundaries that can stop the church. And I am... I am well aware of that because we've lived in five different nations of the world and God is doing the same in all of those nations. God loves people. And He is here to expand His kingdom, to enlarge the kingdom of God and to push back darkness so that people can open their hearts and respond to His goodness and mercy. Amen? So here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn. That's what you are. You're a part of the church of the firstborn. Which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shall shake the earth only, not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now notice the last verse. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Hallelujah. Cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know, we are living really today in unparalleled times. The world is changing very quickly. Who would have ever thought that one month we have international travel, the next month international travel to every nation of the world was interrupted. As a matter of fact, right now you can look on a map, you can go online and look at, uh, you know, the different agencies that are monitoring what's going on around the world concerning what they call a pandemic. There's only one nation that has no restrictions, one country, that's Mexico. That's the only one you can fly to right now. All the others have restrictions. Now they want to lift those restrictions, but then they want a 14-day quarantine if you fly into those nations, which makes it difficult for missionaries. You understand that. You don't want to spend 14 days doing nothing. And so every nation of the world has a restriction on travel, you could not devise a plan spiritually to shut down the gospel or to shut down 
missionaries or to restrict travel with the gospel. You could not come up with a plan. But we see today that restriction is in place. And obviously that's not God's plan. I said that's not God's plan. No, God's plan is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Isn't that right? Well, we understand where this comes from. It's not from the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 that Satan, Paul said, is the God of what? The God of what? This world. That word world means world system. He is the ruler or the God of this world. Do you realize our Heavenly Father is not the ruler or the God of this world system? Do you realize that? He's the God, the ruler of His kingdom. The Bible tells us there are three worlds, three kingdoms. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Jesus has been given a name that's above every name, that at the mention of that thing, of His name, that that every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things where? Under the earth. Three kingdoms, three worlds. God is sovereign in His kingdom. He rules His kingdom. And His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that extends from His throne into this world. His kingdom was established by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said the kingdom does not come by observation. It is in you. When you are born again, the king comes to live on the inside of you and you become a part of his kingdom that is an unshakable kingdom that cannot be moved. We call it the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, or the kingdom of God. And if you're born again, you're in that kingdom. You're not waiting to be in that kingdom the moment you die. You're in that kingdom now. Hallelujah. So there is God's kingdom. There's man's kingdom. And man is ruling this world. You look around the world today, you'll see every nation has a person or persons in charge of the governments of those nations. Man's still ruling. But there's another kingdom. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not the battle we're in. But against what? Principalities and powers. The rulers the rulers, the rulers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. See, God's not ruling this world. I said, God's not ruling this world. He's ruling His kingdom. He's ruling His church. And if you are in the body of Christ, you're in the church. We live in this world, but we are in the kingdom of God. Therefore, we have access to everything heaven has made available to us through Jesus Christ. And the way God moves and manifests Himself in this world is through His body, the church, which includes you. The way God's kingdom is expanded is through you. The way God's mercy and love is revealed and manifested is through you. The way God's power is demonstrated is through you. Peter, on the way to prayer, passed by a crippled man begging, born that way. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit stopped him. And he said, I don't have any money to give you right now, but I do have something. Such as I have, he said, I'm going to give you. What did Peter have? He had the power of God, the life of God. He had the name of Jesus. And there was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And the man who was crippled that no one could cure or heal was healed by God. Now notice this, the people came running together and Peter said, no, 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 don't look at us. Don't look at me. It was not my power. It was not my holiness that caused this man to be healed. It was faith in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have something from God and God has deposited something in you that will change the world around you. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your family. It'll change where you work. It is the power of God, the life of God, the kingdom of God being extended through you into this world. You know, I love Psalm 23. I'm way off my notes, but that's okay. I love Psalm 23 that says, the Lord is going to be my shepherd. Huh? No. The Lord what? Is. The, 23, the 23rd Psalm, we quote it very often at funerals, but it's not a funeral psalm. The 23rd Psalm is the present day 
ministry of Jesus Christ. It's where we're living. Psalm 22 talks about the death of Jesus. Psalm uh, 24 talks about Jesus coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Psalm 23 is where we are right now. The Lord is my shepherd and I do not lack. He leads me to green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Hallelujah. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's this world, nothing will affect me. He prepares a table in front of me in the presence of mine enemies. There are no enemies in heaven. He's talking about right here. He said, my cup runs over. Aren't you glad? It's not like, well, if you can look in the bottom of that cup and get a long enough straw, maybe you can get a little of the blessings out. No, my cup runs over. Why? It's enough for you, and you can be a blessing to others. Surely goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. That's here, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. See, the Lord is your shepherd. He doesn't take a vacation or a break from being your shepherd. He's not just with you. He's in you. He's in you. Hallelujah. He's in you. We live in a world that has been affected by what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Unfortunately, what they did brought spiritual sin and sickness and disease and death into this world. But God had a plan. He revealed it immediately. He clothed Adam and Eve with skins from animals and initiated blood sacrifice or atonement for sin. And his plan finally was consummated 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ who became a man, God becoming a man and came to this earth and lived for 33 and a half years and was tempted in all points like Adam was. But like the first Adam, he did not do. He did not succumb to sin. He was tempted in all points and he resisted sin. And he gave up his life on the cross. And the sin of humanity came upon him. And Jesus, through his death and his burial and descent into hell, paid the penalty of that sin. And Jesus came upon, or the Holy Ghost came upon Jesus and raised him from the dead. And he ascended into heaven and placed his blood on the heavenly mercy seat. And redemption was complete. And everyone who believed on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit came into your spirit and quickened you and recreated you. And the power and the life of God is now resonant in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In you. You are in the kingdom of God that is unmovable, unshakable. And it's expanding around this world. People say, where is God in all of this? Where he always has been. He is operating in this earth through his body. God can do nothing in this world without the church. John Wesley said it seems God is so limited by what he can do for humanity. He can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. The kingdom of God can do nothing on this, in this earth, in this world without you, without the church. God uses you to expand his kingdom, his bring, to usher in his goodness and his mercy, to be a vessel of his, of his power. Hallelujah. So that is the importance of the church today. I want to share something real quickly. Uh, you know, in every nation, and, and I've been, we've been in over 30 nations of the world and have lived in five nations of the world. Many of these I'm talking about I've been to, not all of them. <clears throat> but God is moving. In China, 23 to 25,000 people a day are coming to Jesus. In Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, I could talk about Thailand, Cambodia. I could talk about Laos. I could talk about Myanmar. Wonderful things happening in Burma, in Myanmar, just, just there in January. Wonderful things happening. I was just talking to a young man who graduated from a Bible school. He's Iranian. And he, uh, he was Shiite, Muslim, and he got converted came to the Bible school. He and his family, he's going back to Iran. And he told me personally, he said, there's revival. There's amazing things happening in Iran. You'll never hear on the news. And it's a miraculous revival, and it's being led by women, by ladies. Come on, guys. <laughs> by the ladies. Amazing, miraculous things happening. Visions. Miraculous healings and manifestations of the Holy Ghost. 
because there are people in that nation who want to be free. There are people in that nation who want to experience what God has for them. Amazing things happening there. Amazing things happening in Africa. Africa is 43% Christian today. 43%. This, this spring, I think it was April, the Christian population of Afri Africa for the first time in the history of the church has exceeded the Christian population in South America. There are some nations in Africa that are 95.5% Christian. In Nigeria on Sunday morning, all the shops, all the stores close because everyone's in church. Hallelujah. God's moving in nations. We may not hear about it. He's moving. There's a harvest taking place around the world. Amazing things. I was in Indonesia, uh, and it, we've gone there many times. And uh, the government will not publish the number, the percentage of Christians. It's the largest Muslim nation in the world. But today, the Christian church in Indonesia is between 25 and 35 percent of the population. That's remarkable. 25 to 35 percent of the population in that nation. Pastor wanted me to share this story. I'll share it. I was there a few years ago. We were preaching in Indonesia. And uh, small church, I gave an altar call. A man came forward, accepted Jesus. And so uh, I was about to leave that service, and the pastor came and said, hey, I have to tell you something. Uh, this gentleman that came, this man that came to God, that got saved, he, he wanted to tell you this. And he said three nights ago, he said he was in his house, and an angel appeared to him, a man in white. He didn't know it was an angel. A man all in white. And he gave him an address. He said, you go to this address, and there'll be a foreign person come, and they'll speak words to you, and you listen to what they say. He gave him the address of the church. He came that night. We preached the gospel, and he was born again. That happens over and over and over and over. Supernatural things. The power of God in manifestation, just unbelievable. We had one pastor in one church. They came through with machine guns and shot every home, attempted to kill every Christian in that, shot every home with machine guns, every single home. People were killed. His wife and his child, he was not there, was on the bed, in the bedroom. Not one bullet they could find, not one bullet hole in the house, anywhere. That's God's protection. The Lord is our shepherd. He protects those that follow him and serve him. Amen. We serve a supernatural God. Amen. Supernatural God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish I had time. I could tell you story after story after story, supernatural things that have happened to us all over the world. But he's the same supernatural God right here, Amen. right here in this nation. And so I want to share two things with you here in the time that I have left. You know, it's interesting, as I said, John Wesley said, it seems that God is limited by our prayer life, that he can do nothing. He can do nothing. He can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. Well, that's opposite to what you hear in most seminaries today. What you hear in most Bible colleges today is absolute sovereignty mentality. That that is God is in control of everything. Everything that happens is a part of his perfect plan and will. No, it's not. That's not scriptural. Sickness and disease is not his perfect will. Destruction and death is not God's perfect will. If that's his perfect will, then you'll have that in heaven. Isn't that right? Jesus prayed that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we saw Jesus demonstrate God's will. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Isn't that right? That's God's will. You want to know what God's will is? Look at the life of Jesus. That's God's will. That's God's will. And that's God's will for humanity. No, God is only sovereign in His kingdom. Listen to me. He's only sovereign in His kingdom, and His kingdom extends from heaven to this earth through the body of Christ, the church. 
Jesus is the head of the church, not the head of the world. Amen. Jesus in John chapter 17 prayed for his disciples. He said, Father, I pray that you not take your disciples out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. We are the light of the world. How do people in the world know about God? Through you. How do they understand the nature of God, the character of God? Through you. We are the world's Bible. You may be the only Bible some people ever read. Think about it. Amen. We represent God. We are ambassadors of God. We represent the kingdom of God. If we do not yield to the power of God, the presence of God, God cannot move in this world. Now, God will do some things supernaturally just to get people's attention. But the primary way God works in this world is through the church, through the local church, through local churches around the world. Now, I want to read two scriptures, one found in John chapter 9, and we'll read verses 4 and 5. And I want to leave you with one challenge today, just one challenge. John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said, I must work the work of him that sent me. That's the Father. I must work the work of him that sent me while it is what? Day. Because the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. If you're born again, if you're a child of God, now you are also a light to this world because the light's on the inside of you. Jesus is on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit's on the inside of you. You now become a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, a part of the kingdom of God. You now are light. You now are salt. The church, the body of Christ, we're here for a purpose. Not just so that we can gather things unto ourselves no thank God for his blessing but that's not the purpose the purpose is so that God can flow through us so that we can become a channel of God's power and anointing so that rivers of living water can flow out of us to others that's what God wants that's what God desires and that's why we're here now there is an apparent reference in this statement that refers to something that will happen in the life of Jesus he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, because the night cometh when no man can work. Obviously, he is talking about his own ministry. We know that. Six months from this statement, Jesus was crucified. So we know he is speaking about his own life. He was the only light of the world at that moment. But I believe there's also a profound principle that applies to us today. And I like what Albert Barnes said, he said that we should seek. This means that we should seek for opportunities of doing good and suffer none to pass without improving it. We go but once through this world and we cannot return to correct errors and recall neglected opportunities of doing our duty. So in this verse, to me, day represents opportunities from God. Night represents missed or past opportunities and we all have opportunities God will bring opportunities into your life to affect people to touch people's lives to witness to people to make a spiritual impartation into that person's life these are opportunities that come from God because you are God's hands and feet and mouth he cannot move in this earth without without you and so Jesus said, the, he said, I've got to work while it's day. Look around the world today. Look around. People are looking for answers. They don't have the truth. Most people don't have the truth. You have the truth. You have a great church. You've been receiving the word of God. You know the truth of God's word. Amen. You know more probably than the average pastor in most developing nations know. You have more word and more truth. For what purpose? Paul said, I planted, 
Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything or he that watereth, but it's God who gives the increase. We are here to plant, to water, so that God can give the increase. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have opportunities that come. We don't want to stand before Jesus one day and think about the opportunities that we allow just to pass us by. Opportunities to help people, to touch people, to let people know about God's life and His love and His power. I want to connect this to Ephesians 5.16. Paul said in Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We live in a world that has problems. Oh, every nation has problems. Every nation is experiencing turmoil and problems. And unfortunately, it's because in the beginning, when Adam and Eve yielded and disobeyed God, sin came into this world and sin began to rule and dominate this whole world and affected everything, including the environment, including nature itself. Jesus came to do something about the sin problem. Amen? To offer a gift that will change man from the inside out and that will establish a kingdom of light and a kingdom of love and mercy and goodness in this dark world that is to expand and to influence others. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. Now, here he said, redeem the time, for the days are, are evil. In this short verse, there's a powerful message. There are two ancient Greek words used for time. One has the idea simply of day upon day, hour upon hour. The other has the idea of a definite portion of time, a time where something should happen. It is the difference between time in general and the time, a specific time. And the idea here is a specific time. It is a definite season of opportunity that Christians must redeem. As the New Living Testament says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. So here Paul is saying if you have an opportunity, God gives you an opportunity, redeem it, purchase it, buy it up, don't let it go, invest in it. Because it's an opportunity for God to use you and to flow through you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was in Starbucks the other day when they finally opened. We live in, we're in Broken Arrow, Tulsa right now. Uh, we have, a, that's where our home is, our son's living. So when we're off the field, we come back to Tulsa, Oklahoma. <clears throat> and so we're in Starbucks and everyone, you know, everyone's standing back and everyone's kind of looking at you suspect, right? You know, like you're a carrier or something. Yeah, I'm a carrier. Don't get too close, you might get saved. <laughs> you, might, you might get the Holy Spirit. Don't get too close. So I remember my brother and I walked into this coffee shop. My brother uh, lives in Iowa, and so he's, uh, he's a veteran. He's retired, and so we're out. He's, he's actually uh, a courier. He picks up uh, samples from hospitals, so I was riding with him. Takes them and delivers them. So that day we were picking up COVID-19 samples. We had five of them in the back seat in the cooler, riding with COVID-19. So we walked into a coffee shop, and of course they knew what he was doing. Everyone stepped back <laughs> like this. And so we started talking to him. Said, you know, the Bible says in the 91st Psalm, no plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. Right. What? The Bible says that? Yeah. So we preached to him a little bit right there in the coffee shop. But I was in Starbucks the other day, same thing. I talked to this lady. I said, you know, the Bible says, the 91st Psalm says, no plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. What? That's in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible. You know, God wants to heal you and keep you well. No, I didn't know that. So I took the time to preach to her right in Starbucks. You know, there are opportunities all around us. People are looking for answers. They're full of fear, full of fear. But God's word will set you free from fear. 
Fear is not from God. It is a spiritual force from the enemy. And I encountered it in China. And I had to deal with it. It is a spiritual force. It's tangible. And if it will control you, it will. If it can, it will control you. But you can be set free from fear this morning. God's not given to you a spirit of fear. It doesn't come from Him. He's given you a spirit, the Holy Spirit, of power and love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. Strong mind. Hallelujah. I had an experience. I got to tell this experience, Pastor. I was in China. This is our first or second year there. I didn't know Chinese like I know today. And so I, I walked into this particular place and I was <clears throat> these Chinese gentlemen in there and one of them turned and said something to me in Chinese. I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand Chinese. Now today I would have understood what he said, but I didn't understand the moment he spoke to me, I felt something tangible come on me, like somebody came by and put a coat on me, and I became instantly afraid. I never had an experience like this before. I went home to my apartment. I told my wife, first time, and at that time, we'd have been married, uh, I don't know, 20-some 20, 20 years, 25, 26, 27 years. <clears throat> and I said, you got to pray for me. I don't want to leave the house, the apartment. And for three days, I didn't want to leave the apartment. I was in the bathroom shaving, and I heard a voice. It sounded audible to me. It wasn't audible. And the voice said, if you'll stop praying for this nation, I'll leave you alone. Well, now I've identified the problem. I've identified the voice, not God. Because God said in His Word in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, First of all, pray, right? Prayers, intercessions, supplications, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority that you might experience a quiet and peaceable life. Well, I'm not going to stop praying. So the battle started. And I have to tell you, my brother and sister, it was, the, it was something I never experienced in 30-some years of ministry at that point. And two years... I fought. Now, I continued to minister. I continued to operate and function. You wouldn't know by looking on the outside that anything was going on. But there was a battle going on. Every minute, every hour of the day, crazy thoughts, wild thoughts come into your mind, all kinds of things. You're going to lose your, you're going to lose your life. You're going to lose your ministry. You're going to go insane. I never could understand people dealing with this kind of torment before now I do before I just say ah oh, just you know quote God's word and resist it now I understand when you go through something then you understand it's not like you have a cut on your arm and you can administer first aid and put a band-aid it's here you can't do that and it's constant constant thank God I can sleep the moment my head hits the pillow I'm asleep but the moment I got awake there it is there it is, every day, every day, every hour, every minute. Now, the thoughts were not real, but the torment was real. So you say, what did you do? I acted on the Word. The only example we have in the Bible of Jesus resisting the devil is found in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, and three times he quoted the Word of God. Three verses out of the book of Deuteronomy. And then the devil leaveth him. You cannot fight the devil with thoughts. He'll win. You cannot fight the devil with imaginations. He'll win. You fight the devil with words. Speaking God's word out of your mouth, that is the sword of the Spirit. Amen. I must have quoted that verse. God's not given me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind thousands of times. Every day. Every day. Every day. And it disappeared slowly, 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 slowly until it all disappeared. All disappeared. See, you have to resist when fear comes. There's not one verse in the Bible that tells the believer to pray to God and to ask God to fight the devil for them. Amen. Not one verse in the New Testament. 
No. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, you resist him with your faith. Ephesians 4, 27, you neither give place to the devil. James 4, 7, you submit to God, you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Mark chapter 16 says, you will cast out devils in the name of Jesus. You. Why you? Because you have the name of Jesus. Because you have the power of God available to you. Because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have the Word of God, everything you need. When the attack comes, when the enemy comes, when thoughts come, you resist them. You resist them and they have to leave. You resist the devil by resisting anything that comes from the devil. Amen? I want to pray for you in closing. Father, I thank you for your word today. Give us opportunities to be a blessing to people. Oh, Father, when opportunities come, help us to see them. Help us to know what they are. Let us open our hearts, Father, to receive from you. Let us ask, Heavenly Father, every day, make us a blessing to someone. Father, right now, I know by the Holy Spirit that someone here is battling more than one, is battling with fear, is tormenting them, ruling their life, dominating their life. Father, fear, we know is fear is not from you. It is from the enemy. And so, Father, right now, I break the power of the devil over those individuals. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the devil to take his hands off of their life, off of their minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave them. Fear, go in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I ask you to help those individuals. I pray like Paul prayed, that you would strengthen them by a spirit of might in their inner man. Father, when the thoughts come, help them resist with your word and with your spirit. Help them stand strong, having done all to stand, stand in the name of Jesus. And those thoughts cannot come back, cannot come back, cannot come back, cannot come back in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Say this with me, I'm a child of God. Say it like you mean it. I'm a child of God. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me. I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm in the family of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Greater is he who is in me than any force in the world. I can do what God says I can do. I resist all thoughts of fear in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for freedom. I thank you for freedom. Say it like you mean it. I thank you for freedom. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free free. in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Stay free. Stay free. Stay free. Don't let those thoughts dominate you. Resist it. When those thoughts come, resist it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we love you guys. Thank you so much for your prayers, your support. Pastor's coming. I went over just a little bit, but we love you guys. Thank you so much. Keep following and serving God. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, don't forget to share it with your friends and family and click subscribe. For more information, you can head over to victoryfamilychurch.com or click the link below.